Welcome to UTI Swatantra Series, powered by ET Now. This is an ongoing initiative to educate as many investors as possible this year so you can be rich over the long term. That's our only aim, really, to make you rich. If you'd like to ask us a question or leave us a message, we have a website set up for exactly that. It's called indiainvestcaro.com. Get onto the website. You'll see videos and footage of these shows. You can leave us a question or a message. Or if you'd like to tweet out your question, hashtag investcaro. It'll be our pleasure to hear from you. We have a wonderful episode planned out for you today. We're going to talk about H&Is. How is money different for them? How is planning different for them? And can they use the same mutual funds that everybody else uses? What should they be doing? We have an audience in the studio right now who've come armed with questions for our panelists. But I want to do a very quick introduction of the two gentlemen on the panel with me. Tanvir Alam is the founder and CEO of FinCard. and Ajay Thiagi, Executive Vice President and Fund Manager at UTI AMC. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming in. Ajay, I will start with you. Um, a lot of times, there are portfolio management services that, let's say, quote the H&Is, because people go out and say, this is the kind of thing you should be using. You're a special investor. You need special treatment. Can they just use a regular mutual fund like everybody else, or should they be using special products that give them special treatment? Well, I think uh, money has no color. And to that extent, uh, whether you are an HNI or you are a normal investor, mutual funds can be used by all and sundry. So essentially, what does a mutual fund do? A mutual fund essentially invests into an underlying asset. In case of an equity mutual fund, you would ultimately be investing into underlying companies, which could be an ITC, which could be a Maruti, which could be a, a BHEL or an Infosys and so on. And the underlying earnings growth in each of these companies is captured by the share prices of these companies, which gets reflected in the NAV of the mutual fund. So when it, when it comes to wealth creation, what we are saying is that a mutual fund would ultimately invest into one of these companies, which is getting positively benefited by the uh, robustness of the economy, their earnings growth are climbing up, and hence you know, the mutual fund NAV moves up in accordance with that. What does a PMS do? Pretty much the same thing. So a PMS manager would invest the corpus of the HNI into each of these uh, uh, stocks, just like a mutual fund uh, fund manager would have done. But I would also like to bring to your attention one difference between the two products, which is that in terms of taxation, mutual funds are actually a more tax-friendly product compared to a PMS. Because mutual funds, as per the taxation law in India, are not taxed, as in the scheme which invests into these underlying companies is not taxed, whereas in case of PMS, ultimately the investor is directly holding on each of these securities, and these securities are amenable to short-term capital gains tax. So that's the big difference between the two things. All right. Um, I want to very quickly bring uh, you and Tanvi here. Is, should there be a difference in the way an h &I individual plans his money? We, so we, the advice we give to a normal retail investor who has 5,000 rupees to spare every month, where we tell him that, you know, buy an insurance policy, buy health insurance, invest in a mutual fund. It's actually simple as that. How should it be different from, for someone who has far more than 5,000 rupees a month to invest? Okay, most people buy ad hoc products, but it should be the other way around. The product that you buy, it should be based on your goals. And given the fact that the goals for a h &I is very different from a retail audience, hence the the solution is very different. Now, for a normal person, the requirement of children education, reti funding retirement, buying assets are there. But for a h &I, most of the goals of this nature, they could very well achieve because they've garnered enough asset or money for themselves. Hmm. Their goals are very different. In fact, uh, now let me give you some examples which will define. For example, if you look at, uh, say, a sports personality, okay, or a, a film artist, They're, they start their career very, career very early in the life, and their retirement is somewhere around mid-30s. So now they want to have money enough for the su surviving the rest of the life. Not if you're Amitabh Bachchan. Not if you're Amitabh Bachchan. <laughs> and very few are there, right, of that nature. For example, if you look at, uh, say, a large family office, for example, a very large family office with multiple stakeholders and a mesh of stakeholders, 
there the requirement is very different. There the requirement is more of succession planning, how the business gets handed over, and how the interest of all this family member gets taken care of. So there the need of a family office is more predominant than just meeting those goals and objective. That's what is very different. All right, I want to do a very quick show of hands in this room. Um, how many of you believe that the advice you receive on a regular basis when it comes to your investments is inadequate or you believe it doesn't explain things clearly enough or this, it still leaves a lot to be desired? Anybody who feels that the advice is inadequate, please raise your hand. So, so that does seem like, like a huge deal. You know, this is the problem that, that we've encountered on a regular basis. When someone has a fair amount of money in a bank account, they will receive a lot of phone calls from a lot of people saying, you know, this is what you should do with your money. That's what you should do with your money. Don't leave it lying around. But there is a need somehow, there's a gap in explaining things simply. Just sort of understanding what this product is that you're selling me. Do you think that on some level as a customer we should push the envelope a little more, ask more questions, be a little clearer about what we're buying? Absolutely, because if you really want to uh, have a plan or an asset allocation, which is going to take care of your retirement needs, A, or B, growing your wealth, then you have to be very much aware about what each of these asset classes stand for. So to that extent, uh, I think you have to uh, you know, engage with your advisor ask questions, try to figure out whether he's really directing your money into an asset class which would really grow. Is the expense ratio very low in the product in which you're investing? Because ultimately, expense ratio is a big retarding force in terms of the final money that you would accumulate for yourself. Simple rules of uh, you know, finance, maybe I can just uh, walk you through them uh, very quickly. So, you know, there are four or five big asset classes, you know, or anywhere around the world. So you start with something as uh, commonly appreciated as real estate. All of us invest in a house and sometimes into a second house and so on. Then in India, something of huge amount of interest is gold, which is, which is actually pretty typical to India. Then you have uh, you know, fixed deposits. Some people who feel that fixed deposits are really uh, not that tax friendly go for debt mutual funds. And then the highest level of risk as well as return are equity mutual funds or shares. Now, India would have a limited history of about 30 years, documented history of 30 years, but if you were to look at the US markets, which have a documented history of at least 200 years, then the last asset class which I mentioned, which is equity, stroke equity mutual funds, it really pales off all other asset classes over the long term. So I think the first thing we need to be conscious about is that if we need growth, if we want our assets to really grow for our future, whether for our retirement needs or to uh, you know, generally, generate wealth for our future generations, then a reasonable chunk of your money has to be parked into this one asset class. The other asset classes do have their own uh, you know, importance. For instance, for liquidity needs, you would want to park some money into either an FD or a debt mutual fund and so on. So I think this is one big thing which you need to be really aware of. So whenever uh, you know, some products are discussed with you by your advisor, you have to really be aware of two things. One, what is your asset allocation into each of these classes? And like I mentioned, equity should really, over the longer term, equity should really form a reasonably good chunk of your uh, portfolio. And number two, you should be really aware about the expense ratio underlying any of the products across asset classes. You know, this is advice that can, that can be applicable to anybody watching right now. If somebody is trying to sell you a product, these are the questions you should ask them. How much is this going to cost me finally? How much are you going to take out of it as your own commission? And what are the charges? What sort of return can I expect? what sort of risk comes with this product, and what is the asset class, finally, that my money is going to wind up into. These are four questions you have to get answers to before you start any investment at all. I want to open the floor for uh, questions from the audience. Does anybody have a question? Yes, the gentleman in the front, go ahead. No, you have told that a uh, major chunk should be go to the equities, sure. and um, rest should be in the uh, debt, fixed deposit, gold. So what should be the percentage in each assets class if I want to invest in each asset? Class. So it is very context dependent although. So in a sense, uh, your financial advisor will have to sit with you and draw out a plan with you which is really suiting your own peculiar and typical requirements. On a rule of thumb basis, again, this is, uh, this is a time-tested rule, but it's a very general, uh, you know, generic rule which says that 100 minus your age should be your investments into equity. So for a youngster who is just uh, started with his job and he's at the age of 25, 
In the initial year, 75% of his savings should be directed into equities and 25% into fixed income. When you are at, let's say, the age of 60, then ideally your allocation into equities should have gradually worked down. But this is very generic. Uh, ultimately, your advisor will have to sit with you and work out a plan which is really going to help you for your own typical needs and requirements. All right, we're going to take a very quick break. When we come back from this break, we'll take more answers, more questions and answers from the audience. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. You're watching the UTI Swatantra series powered by ET Now. This is an initiative to educate as many investors in India as possible before the end of the year. We're talking to H and this week, but there's a lot of advice here that you and I can use in our portfolios as well. And there are also a lot of questions. The gentleman in the front, go ahead, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Ashish Devedi. Uh, Mr. Alam, I have a question uh, for you. How do you compare RD accounts with systematic investment in mutual funds? See, uh, our recurring deposit is nothing but it's a systematic way of putting money in a fixed deposit. Okay, now the fixed deposit come with a secured uh, security of capital, and also, but it has a fixed return of about eight nine percent, whatever is guaranteed to you. Now, in a systematic investment plan in a mutual fund, can be done in a similar product, which is like uh, a bond. Okay, which is almost giving a similar return like a bond fund, like a recurring deposit. It may not come with a guarantee, but as I said, now trying to understand the product, how will it work? A bond fund on a three-year basis have never destroyed capital. Okay, and the return that you will get for a bond fund will be tax efficient in the sense here you are getting nine percent post tax it becomes six percent. There you can get the same eight and nine percent which comes to you tax free. Secondly, more importantly, systematic investment plan could be used in growth asset like an equity mutual fund. Okay, and that will seriously help you in develop uh, creating a long term wealth. Now, I'm just using an anecdote which I wrote an article sometimes in Times. If you look at, see, a PPF is a regular product. Okay, if you're parking, if you're parked one lakh rupees over the next last 15 years in PPF, so 15 lakh rupees would have become 34 lakh rupees only. Same money if you parked in a tax mutual fund for a period of 15 years, you would have got the same tax advantage that 15 lakh would have become almost a crore. That's the difference between what SIP can do for you in investing in a growth mutual fund. Okay, my name is Vijay Mattu. Yes. Uh, my question is uh, uh, to Mr. Alam that uh, I anyway am investing in the stocks, so why should I opt for mutual fund? Yes, sir. Uh, see, let me put very differently. If you think you're doing very well in investing in direct stocks, by all means do. How does, and I have managed some portfolio of some very big uh, CEOs also, they spend a good amount of time, but eventually they have themselves come, Tanvi, this is just fanning my ego. I feel good that I'm fanning my ego and I'm managing my direct equity stock. But I've realized that all equity mutual fund have not be only beaten the Sensex, but a lot of them have beaten my own portfolio also. Now, a simple reason. If you look at an equity fund manager, his whole time job is managing that particular fund. Two, he's supported by professional research analysis who are further segmented in different sector, different industry. Third, they get supported by institutional broking team, okay, who feed them with enough more research support. So with those information, I personally feel they are far better equipped to make those decisions. And if you feel that you can better that, and you have better access to information, by all means you should do that. Uh, I want to bring in Ajay here to answer, you know, to add to that, the fact that you can diversify by using right. a mutual fund. We should be actually going into the market and trying to pick out, you know, sure. a set of stocks sure. that can yeah, give you a full portfolio. What sort of value will that add? It would add immense value. So I, I would basically check all the boxes which uh, Tanvir has just mentioned, and all of them are really important reasons 
to invest into a mutual fund. So, so investment is a full-time job, right? And uh, all of us busy in our different vocations would really not get that kind of a time to research companies, to learn more about the various industries, to try to prognosticate and uh, do an analysis about how would an industry pan out you know, in the next three or five years. Because essentially that's what we're trying to do. You're trying to say that how would the earnings of this particular industry and this particular company pan out in the next five years. So how many of the independent investors really have that time to do it while they're busy with their own vocation? So there, there are solid reasons for parking your money into an equity fund which is being managed by a professional setup. The other point which I want to add uh, to uh, uh, what Tanvi said is the taxation part. See, when you're investing directly into stocks, you are amenable to short-term capital gains tax. And if you flip your portfolio quite often, which, which many investors do, you would actually be eroding a huge amount of the growth that would have otherwise accrued to you, right? As against a mutual fund scheme, which, which doesn't get taxed unless until you actually withdraw money from that particular scheme. Third, very importantly, coming to the point of diversification, of course, yes, I mean, it's been proven that uh, there are benefits of diversification. You reduce the volatility of the fund and you have benefits in terms of a risk adjusted return basis. So that's, that's really very important. So I think all of these points put together really merit, uh, you know, uh, moving your investments on the equity side into equity mutual funds rather than just managing it yourself. Ajay, yeah, I just want to add to that point. See, uh, the beauty of a mutual fund is that you can participate in entire entire gamut of the fund by investing in very small sum of money. Okay. For example, if you liked a big cake which cost thousand bucks, and and you have only hundred bucks in your pocket, so it's very difficult for you to buy. So you pull ten people, convince them to buy a cake and you distribute the cake. That's exactly what it is. So if a small sum of money, if you have one lakh or five lakh rupees, I mean, getting a good healthy portfolio will be difficult because if you buy five, 10 Infosys, it's going to eat up a bulk of your portfolio. I think that's very telling that he called five lakh rupees a small amount of money. <laughs> We're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we have more questions from the audience. We're going to talk about investing your money. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. You're watching the UTS with Tantra series powered by ET. Now, thank you for staying with us. We're talking about investing your money. Now, remember, if you have a question for us, you can always log on to indiainvestguru.com and leave us a question. If you'd like to join us in the studio, feel free to get in touch as well. Copies of the show will be available on that website, and you can tweet out a question to hashtag investguru. It'll be our pleasure to hear from you. We have a few more questions from the audience that I'd like to get through before we wrap up the show. The gentleman in the front, go ahead. My question is to Mr. Tyagi. Uh, Mr. Tyagi, you said in the opening remarks that uh, India has a documented history of 30 years of equity return, while US has a history of 200 years, yeah. where equity has done better than any other asset class. Here, actually, uh, the way I look at it, India has five times more population compared to US. Land is one eighth. Okay, so there may be a case real estate has a better chance in long run because of these two factors. Second, the US corporations, world across they are operating their businesses, not only in US, but outside US also. They have bandwidth in management, they have bandwidth of technology, they have bandwidth of money, of IPR, of everything. Indian corporates, they are operating in India. They do not have those kind of bandwidths. So there may be a case against Indian corporations that trusting them so much and putting money for long term may not be a very great idea. Although 30 years history suggests so. So with these two backgrounds, still you think that equity is a uh, better bet? Indian companies, ever since the Indian economy opened up, so you need to realize that we were really not, our arms were shackled. We were really not allowed to show our prowess before 1991. You know, everything was in a license raj. I remember the famous quote of, uh, Mr. G.D. Birla, who once said that produce as much as you can against the government diktat, right? So those were the days. It's only beyond 1991 that you've seen all these things happen. So it's for a reason that the biggest, one of the biggest, or rather few of the biggest IT companies in the world are the Indian companies because they, they, they started in the 1980s and they were really not perturbed by this license Raj. And today after 30 years, they are the big marquee names. So I think, 
I think it's unfair to uh, not be confident about our entrepreneurs. India has had huge entrepreneurial success. Many of the entrepreneurs in the West, in the US, and in the Silicon Valley are basically Indians, but they were people who had a dream and got the dream financed over there in that setup. But they're basically people who just you know, went out from here. Coming back to the first question that you had about real estate, I think here you can take it in two different ways. One is, let's talk about countries which really have limited land resources against the population that they have. Even in those countries, essentially, re uh, equities have beaten down all other asset classes, including real estate hollow. Closer to India, I mean, I mean if, if what you were saying were to be correct, I mean, we have data for 30, 35 years. Why is it that over a 35 year period, despite the fact that during the first 20 year or the first 15 years period of this 35 year period, Indian businesses were really not allowed to you know, grow in the sense of the word, you know, real estate still hasn't been able to match the equity returns. So, so I think any which way you look at it, you will ultimately, for a reason, figure out that equity is really the best asset class. Yeah, and that's the data that supports sure. it. All right, I want to take the, the question from the gentleman at the front. What the uh, financial advisor charge? Uh, we have uh, multiple models, so I'm, I'm not referring to my also, I'm referring to generic conditions. There are two kind of uh, problem people, one who actually don't charge the uh, investor and get paid by the, uh, the commission that they get by selling uh, products to you, and the other people who actually advise only and are not getting remunerated by selling your product. They're both kind of advisor. You can choose what, whosoever. So one is an advisor, one is a distributor. Distributor, so yes. One is a doctor, the other one is a pharmacist. Yes. So there's very, you know, one is giving you the product, the other one is paying you, you're charging you only for advice. So how much should I ideally pay for advice? See, it depends upon the quantum of the work, typically. But what happens is anywhere in the vicinity of about, uh, depending upon the portfolio size. See, the work limit name. If a portfolio size is big, it can revert from 0.5% to even 2%, depending upon the portfolio size. And one more question, why is the financial advisor are not promoting ETFs? See, ETF, people are promoting ETF. What has happened, India is a developing economy, okay? In, what has happened is historically if you've seen, lot of active fund have outperformed the index fund or ETF, okay? Now, if you don't trust an advisor and if you don't trust a fund house, that is why you can choose an ETF. The expense ratio that is low in ETF, okay? far more gets outperformed by index of, by actively managed fund. So that, that expense doesn't, in a developed economy where beating the benchmark becomes a big challenge, then ETF actually works out well. Correct me Ajay if you're not wrong. No, Ajay, Ajay, even our, uh, you know, accuracy on our ETFs are not as great as we would like them tracking to be error. right now. There, there is a tracking error, sure. which makes actively managed funds far more attractive, which is possible. Which is well, correct. Yeah. And then let me add another thing to this. So what would you have the ETFs on? The underlying would be an index which are the typical indices used here. You'll have the Nifty, you'll have the BSE Sensex, and so on. But then what it also means is that you are entirely missing out on the huge plethora of companies which are outside of this basket of Sensex and Nifty. Look at the last five years, look at the last 10 years, look at the last 15 years. You know, it's only when the information about a particular company has got disseminated and percolated down to the lowest levels that it gets introduced into the Sensex. I'm not saying that Sensex companies don't grow, they do grow. But if you're talking about the real big, you know, alpha that gets generated, oftentimes it gets generated outside of these benchmarks. So there's there's another reason to, you know, be into actively managed funds. All right, I'm being told we've completely run out of time on this show. Gentlemen, thank you so much for spending time with us. The audience has been absolutely wonderful. I do hope you found this helpful. If you'd like to join us, like I told you, in the studio, get in touch with us on our website that's at the bottom of your screen, or you can tweet out hashtag Investcaro. It'll be our pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching. Brought to you by UTI Mutual Fund. Huck ek better zindagi ka. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all the scheme-related documents carefully.